Um, you know, I realize in, in moderating any of these panels, I'm a real outlier because every, every person who's speaking today and who is um, uh, on, uh, giving a talk is a PhD in economics and I'm not. In fact, I remember when I went to law school, one of my, one of my relatives said to me, rather than going on for a PhD in economics, she said to me, uh, I thought you did well in college. But you know we have an unbelievably uh, accomplished panel, and I'm not going to go through their, um, you know, all of their accomplishments because then I wouldn't, we wouldn't have time to hear any of the substance. But the rest of the program, we're going to kind of start up at the macro. So we're going to have a look at the economy in 2013. Then Chin Chao is going to talk about the leadership, and then we're going to go down kind of into the micro, the specific specific reforms that are going to be. Um, that we hope are going to be <coughs> undertaken. So we'll start with uh, with Lu Feng, who I think you all know from from prior years, and um, he has his PhD from a uh, Australia National University, and is yeah. um, no, that's that's actually in, in Leeds. In he's Leeds, and my daughter is from Leeds. Actually, got her master's at Leeds, so I really should know that. Um, so he he received his his PhD at Leeds, and is now the the director of macroeconomic research at um, center at, at uh, Peking University. So let me turn it over to Lu Feng. Each of the speakers is going to speak for around eight minutes, and then we'll open the floor to questions. Thank you, uh, Steve. Uh, nice to come back. And it's so difficult to, and to uh, give a talk after Justin Lin's uh, so passionate and so exciting speech. But fortunately, I can talk different uh, the issues differently from Justin's. You know, Justin look at the Chinese economy in a very long period, over thousand years as a background. background but I can look at the issue only in the very short term. And last year, I also talked here about the short term macroeconomic situation in China. So we talked about the slowdown of the economic growth as well as adjustment. I also argued that China will sustain high growth in many years to come. This year, I think the key word I can select to assess the current economic situation and the short-term future situation, you know, use the word stabilized situation, you know, China towards a stabilized econ uh, growth. Uh, using this word of the stabilized growth, we mean two things. One thing is that China economic growth has been slowed down in recent years, but there's a convincing evidence indicate China's economy is stabilized uh, towards the end of last year. And uh, secondly, as also mentioned by Justin, uh, Chinese uh, leadership and the government will pay more and more attention, okay, high priority to stabilize the growth, uh, to avoid it. Uh, the excessive and too, you know, inflationary and the growth model. So through this kind of the stabilized growth model, and China will continue to contribute uh, even growing uh, share of the global economic growth in future. So I would like, I would like to elaborate these points, you know, in, in the coming uh, seven or eight minutes or so. So first, if you look at data, over the last 10 years or so. Okay, can I have the slides? Uh, Chinese economy has experienced two unique, you know, two distinguished periods over the last 10 years or so. You know, one period is from 2003 to 2007. You know, it has been characteristic as a superior boom period. Okay, the peak growth rate for 2007 is, was something like more than 14%, of course, with a high inflation, with significant inflation. The second period is after that, it's huge fluctuation as well as the swings of the growth. Over the last three, three years or so, Chinese economy witnessed gradually slowing down of the economic growth, okay? And it also uh, caused a lot of worries, not only inside China, but also uh, global markets. Uh, fortunately, last year, you know, 
and towards the, uh, the fourth quarter of last year, we had the program, so-called land rim forecast of the macroeconomic situation. We coordinated this program, you know, and uh, incorporated with a few dozens of institutions inside China to give prediction of macroeconomic performance in the short term. So the fourth quarter growth rate, according to the land rim forecast, was something like 7.8%. Uh, it's significantly higher than the actual figure of the 4.7.4% uh, in the quarter three last year. Can I use that? Yeah. So actually, uh, uh, sorry, I, I, I also prepared some slides, but uh, because some technical reasons, I cannot present that. Uh, but actually, if you look at the actual figure and the long-run forecast figures, then you will see over the last uh, five or six quarters or so, and uh, in most of the times, the Chinese economies, the mainstream Chinese economists overestimated. Okay, that's good. How can I do that? Yeah, that, that is the two periods, you know, you can see the, the, the two periods over the last 10 years or so. Then you can see the long-run forecast give 7.8% for quarter four. But actually, if you see, oh, sorry, blackout. Oh, it's come back. Oh, yes, we got that. Actually, you can see here, uh, Actually, you can see over the last uh, three, uh, five or six quarters or so, most, in most of the times, the mainstream opinions of the macroeconomists inside China overestimated you know, the, the projected growth rate. So we registered the so-called positive land-run forecast errors. Okay. But this quarter, the fourth quarter, you know, the, uh, the medium or average the, the, the average of the uh, estimate of the growth rate was something like 7.8% is higher than quarter three, 7.4%. So that figure is likely to be in line with the actual situation, maybe also lower than actual figure because a lot of reasons. I would like to uh, present some evidence to support why I believe and most of the economists believe land run forecast for quarter four uh, will have a, a, a better performance. So the, in the short run, uh, macroeconomic situation are best explained by the monetary indicators. Then you can see the broad money as well as the loans growth rate has been stabilized and even marginally increased in the second uh, the half of the last year. Okay. Also, on the, on the right hand of the uh, chart, you can see uh, there's a difference between the growth rates for the social, total social finance and uh, credit. Then you can see even, you know, and uh, how can I say, the growth rate of the total social finance has been increased even more significantly than credit. Here, maybe we can look at the differences between uh, the, the, the total social finance and uh, credit as well as uh, conventional broad money indicators. Uh, Justin Lin emphasized in China because the, we still have some legacy from the uh, old systems, so there's still significant the phenomena, the so-called uh, financial depression. As a result of the financial repression, so uh, the market innovated a lot of the practices which make the social, how can I say, the total social finance quite different. The growth rate of the social finance, uh, so, uh, total social finance, quite differently from the credit. Then you can see the credit, the share of the credit in the total social finance has been declined dramatically in the uh, recent decade or so, in recent decade or so. So I think, uh, uh, it is believed by uh, most economists in China, you know, the total uh, 
uh, social finance growth rate uh, can be uh, better explain the short term and the situation in the macroeconomic areas. Okay. So other issues also, other indicators also uh, provide evidence for the recovery and uh, stabilizing growth rate in future. For example, uh, for the, uh, how can I say, the, 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 the total uh, profit uh, for industrial firms, uh, both of the uh, total amount of profit for industrial firms as well as the growth rate of the profit has been stabilized and has been growth. As well as an official uh, and uh, Hong Kong and Shanghai uh, banking corporations, uh, uh, PMI, also stabilized and picked up marginally in recent months, indicate China's economy has been recovering. Okay. As well as uh, investment and consumptions, the growth rate also fairly strong in the second half of last year. Uh, for the consumptions, you know, retail sales, the fluctuation is tremendous, but average growth rate is still something like uh, 16 or 17 percent in real terms. Okay. Uh, also, housing sales has been picking up in recent months uh, after you know and uh, stagnation for quite long period of time. Finally, the car sales has been stabilized after you know, absorbing this kind of retreat or exit of stimulus policy, okay, uh, to fa uh, providing a lot of subsidies for the car sales after you know, and the financial crisis. That has been encouraged car market uh, witness a huge boom. You know. After uh, exit of these uh, stimulus policies, the car sales has been very sluggish, but now the car sales has been uh, how can I say, has been stabilized. So finally, uh, uh, you can see the growth rate of the e electricity and the steel output, I did not mention here, as well as industrial activities, has been stabilized and improved recently. So in, in, summary, in summary, so the various indicators uh, suggest that China's, China's economic growth has been stabilized in recent years. So if you assume the quarter four growth rate for China is 7.8%, then the total growth rate for last year would be also uh, around 7.8%. That was rather slow growth rate, the lowest one over the last 10 years. But even with that growth rate, if you assume, if assume the world growth rate, the global economic growth rate, is something like 2.5% to 3%, then China incremental contribution to the global growth is still something like more than 70% to, uh, uh, sorry, 31% to 37%. That was significantly, substantially higher than what witnessed in recent decades. So that highlights, you know, and even China's economy slowing down a bit, stabilized, China's global contri uh, contribution to the global economy is still very high. So what about next year? You know, a lot of projection, projections about next year. So there's a 51 market institutions projection. How many times? Two, two, How much time? Two yeah. You're, I'll give no. you six, 60 okay. seconds more. Okay, 60 seconds. Okay. <laughs> la, la, the, the coming year, 51%, uh, 51 uh, constitutions reported by Bloomberg uh, reported the growth rate. Uh, most of them give the growth rate between 66 uh, to 8.5. Okay. It, it also included uh, projections by the various international organizations. Then you can see there's a two categories of projections. The lower one is something like relatively lower rates is something like 7.5 to 8%, higher rates is 8 to 9%. The best guess now we have for next year, for the current year, is something like 8.1 to 8.2% this year. That is in line with my prediction at this forum last year that China will sustain 
with high growth, also consistent with Justin Lin, you know, for the next uh, two decades or so. Uh, finally, I, I, I must emphasize that China's incremental contribution to the global economy, you know, growth is likely to be maintained at the level over 30% or so, keeping the status as the one of the most important growth poles for the world economy. Thank you. talk about China's capital markets and investment strategy. Let me turn it over to Huang Huaizhou, who is the managing director and the chief strategist of China International Capital Corporation and is a Hoosier PhD. Okay. Thanks, Steve, and it's a pleasure to be back. I also prepared a few slides, and uh, probably uh, given that I have eight minutes to run, I quickly pick up a few slides to basically uh, uh, to share with you. Um, uh, my topic is on China's capital markets and investment strategy. Uh, uh, I think that uh, um, uh, China's market, basically, if you, uh, I want to give the, you know, the highlight before the presentation, probably, uh, at the beginning of the presentation. First of all, that uh, they, if you look at the uh, financial market reform, uh, capital market reform in particular, I, I, you, you probably see that, uh, uh, first of all, that uh, uh, interest rate liberalization is driving uh, China's uh, market reform uh, recently. I think that in retrospect, in five years from now, that will be very, very important, okay? Secondly, that the, uh, the, uh, uh, the second force of our capital market reform is renminbi internationalization. Uh, I think that together with the interest rate liberalization, I think that both probably will keep driving China's uh, capital market reform for the next three to five years. So that's the first point I want to get across. Secondly, I think that if you look at uh, China's in investment strategy, I also talked here um, before, I think that uh, really um, for the last three years, okay, uh, 2012, China, so if you look at the Shanghai Composite Index, or uh, Shenzhen Composite Index, pretty much China, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, didn't do that well, but it's pr pretty much like ground zero, okay? Uh, the year before, much worse, okay, uh, which is 2011, and the year before that, China also ended up in a negative territory. Uh, we believe that uh, into 2013, uh, the market will continue to improve in China. So we are, in a way, uh, more optimistic for China's investment uh, into uh, 2013 for both the A share and the H share. And uh, our strategy uh, calls for two round of rallies, uh, one in the spring, one in the, in the fall, uh, each probably uh, in, a, in, a, in a range of uh, 15, 20 percent. Okay, we continue, uh, uh, we continue uh, despite the uh, the, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the market rally in December, we continue to believe the rally will continue to come. That's the, sec the second point. Uh, we'll we talk about some um, uh, short-term phenomena of short-term macro. I, I guess that given that Professor Lofun already talked about that, so I uh, quickly skip that. Um, and then I'll talk a little about uh, uh, China's uh, 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 capital market reform uh, in the medium, medium term. I, I think that probably will, will give us uh, uh, some framework to think about. First of all, if you look at uh, China's capital market, <laughs> I think that uh, it's a market that has been rapidly growing. Uh, however, the market uh, actually, in, in the last three years, uh, actually entered some kind of corrections, okay? Uh, that, this, this, the top left slides show where, you know, they, uh, uh, in a way that they, the Asia market. Um, I think that the Asia market in China, uh, over the last three years in particular, uh, uh, didn't do that well. <laughs> if you compare to global markets, Okay, uh, over the last three years, probably one of the best market is the U.S. is the NYSE. Okay, and uh, uh, then to be followed by some developed markets. Last year, Germany. Last year, also some of the worst part of the economy uh, in Europe, for example, the Greek market was one of the top performer. Okay, that's basically the. the but uh, last year, if you compare China with some developing countries, I think that the second tier developing countries. Um, not, you know, not BRIC countries uh, did better. Uh, among BRIC countries, India, India market probably was, uh, was the best, okay? But the reason India market outperformed other markets probably was rooted in reform, okay? India uh, uh, announced the new government and then uh, started reform in, uh, in September. China, of course, last year held the 18th Party Congress. Again, China uh, announced that they want to uh, you know, do more reform and Professor Chen, uh, 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 Chairman Chen, we're talking more about this. I think that uh, the market start to basically price in China's effort for reform 
Uh, so in the last month of our last year, December, the market had a rally about 10%. So that's really, which you add everything together, last year was not a great year, but actually the market uh, start, to, uh, start to grow. That's, uh, that's, uh, uh, Hong Kong market last year did better, um, partly because uh, global liquidity uh, affecting Hong Kong market uh, um, uh, uh, str more strongly than, than the China's a Asia market. I guess that uh, this kind of forces continue to play out. Uh, <coughs> from the, uh, the end of last year, actually from uh, September last year, we continue to see that uh, uh, capital inflows uh, towards uh, Hong Kong market to be invested in Hong Kong and, uh, and towards the uh, 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 China market. Uh, in terms of GDP growth, I think that I agree with uh, uh, Professor Lu Feng. I think that uh, we believe that also that uh, 2013 will also be a better year in terms of growth. Our own forecast for 2013's GDP growth rate is 8.1%. Uh, my personal view is that probably uh, this year, they, uh, you know, we will see some upside risk, i.e. Uh, for the whole year, probably the GDP growth rate will be in the range of 8.2 to 8.5% instead of 8.1%. Okay. Uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, important <coughs> policy development that we should watch for, uh, from the, from uh, basically that from December towards the, you know, the end of this year, I think that uh, uh, the first meeting, first very important meeting was held uh, on economic policy was the, the uh, uh, Central Economic Work Conference that was held in December, and at that conference it was made quite clear that uh, you know, growth stabilization will be a key. And that, as we point out by uh, Justin and also by Professor Lu Feng, I think that uh, that uh, second important meeting, of course, is uh, I think that as a, uh, towards the end, probably in, in March, that's the National People's Congress. Uh, at that meeting, of course, a new government of, of China will be uh, formed, and uh, we'll see probably a whole new cast of ministers. And uh, so I think that's very, very important. The third meeting, which I, I think that uh, uh, Chen probably will talk a bit more, which is the uh, you know, the, the, the third uh, planning uh, uh, session of the uh, 18th Party Congress. Once every 10 years, we have such an important meeting to outline uh, China's development strategy for the next 10 years. I, I, I think that so this year we have very, very important reform to be coming up. I think that if you think about the, the growth strategy in China, uh, I, I guess that uh, um, uh, the, there, there is terminology coming out of China called, uh, you know, for modernization. That's some, you know, uh, including uh, industrialization, okay, uh, application of upgrading, upgrading of IT technology, urbanization, and, uh, and uh, also modernization of the culture sector. We believe that uh, those are the four important drivers for China's long-term growth, among which uh, urbanization is the key driver. Okay, that's basically that. I think I'd be happy to take up some questions later on. I don't have time to explain that. I want to spend one minute to talk about this. This is probably is very important. This figure is very important for us to understand China's growth um, because we really need to understand China's, uh, uh, where does the growth coming from? What's the key driver behind the growth? This is really a phenomena, uh, a great phenomena of China's growth over the last 30 years. What we did is that we, we applied the so-called HP filter. We filled out the noise on both the upside and downside. And so basically, that is, this, is, this is China's potential GDP growth over the last 30 years. First of all, I want to remind you that uh, before the Cultural Revolution was ended, in 1975 and 1976, China's real GDP growth rate was, was, was negative, minus 3 to minus 4%. So, so it's not always the case that China can grow at 8% or 5%. China came from minus 4%. Okay, that's basically uh, where, that's what, uh, where China's coming from. Um, 1978, China started reform and opening up, and then basically quickly the growth rate start to accelerate and, uh, towards 10%. So for the last 30 years or so, the average growth rate is, is some, somewhere around 10%. But uh, China also has uh, growth cycles, and. Uh, the growth cycle is also related to political cycle, which is very interesting. Each cycle lasts roughly for about 10 years, okay? Uh, the first cycle starts from 1978, ended in 1989. We know what happened in 1989, okay? The second cycle started from 1989, okay? Roughly ended around 2000. Ended around 2000, I think there are several reasons. First of all, that, you know, by uh, uh, around uh, 1994, China had a runaway inflation. So at that time, Deng Xiaoping appointed Zhu Rongji to, to manage the economy. 
And uh, so uh, China uh, went through a, a painful structural reform of the state-owned sector and also the banking sector. But later on, of course, 97, 98, the Asian crisis also hit China. So in a way that it took much longer time for China's economy to stabilize, around 2,000 China's economy stabilized. I think that, uh, I think that uh, so that is in a way that is uh, partly related in China, partly, uh, of course, it depends on the global development in, you know, Asian financial crisis, so on and so forth. China growth started to pick up for also for two reasons. Domestically, I think that the reform, okay, painfully reform, uh, from 1994 onward, basically start to bear fruit, okay? That's number one, which is domestic, domestic, uh, domestic phenomenon. Uh, internationally, we also know what happened, okay? Around 2000, the U.S. Nasdaq, uh, you know, uh, bubble post, uh, Fed started to mass massively cut the interest rate, so there is a global recovery and, a, and global liquidity fuel global growth in a way that China also benefited from that. Of course, that over that process, uh, you know, China also committed to join the WTO and, uh, and went through further reform. So you adding everything together, China had a great seven years from 2000 to, to you know 2008, which is which the growth rate is truly phenomenal. After 2008, we know what would happen. Where will China will be going? The new government is, of China is just in the corner. And we think that the new uh, wave of reform effort will also be just in the corner. Moreover, I think that the U.S. also commit to massively, <laughs> in a way, to continue to uh, provide liquidity to global market. <laughs> I think that you add in domestic reason, the reform, and uh, you add in global liquidity. So we believe that uh, over the next few years, China's growth will not only stabilize to echo uh, Professor Lufen's point, but also I think that uh, will accelerate. I think that, so, so that, I think that that's really uh, where, where China will be going. So in a way that uh, investing in China, probably now is really a good time. Um, <laughs> I have no book to, uh, to, to, to publicize, but I think I want to publicize strategy, okay? <laughs> so really that I, I think that, uh, so uh, in, in terms of investing strategy, I think the first Important thing we need to keep in mind is that don't underestimate the impact of China's accelerated reform. I think that's a, that probably will be very important, not only for China's market, but also for global market for the next three to five years. Okay, that's a, <laughs> Professor Lofeng said that China's contribution uh, to, to, towards global GDP growth will be uh, you know, over 30%. I think that uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, uh, China's market contribution to global market is far less than that. We hope that China will catch up there. Uh, in terms of investment strategy, as I said, that uh, you know, Asia market, we think that uh, two waves, okay, uh, two rallies uh, in the spring and also in the in the fall. Okay, in the spring, basically, it's returning liquidity, returning mm -hmm. confidence. In the fall, basically, that I we believe that it's uh, you know they uh, they 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 the 18th party Congress third plenary session and uh, outline China's reform for the next 10 years, and plus we believe that U.S. we hope the U.S. growth will start to you know uh, to accelerate after uh, crossing over the physically, one way or the other, okay? And uh, uh, in terms of the H share market, uh, we basically, we call it the same strategy. We believe that uh, the market will continue to rally in the spring, probably will, uh, will, will, will take a break, um, uh, in particular around May, uh, you know, you, 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 and then basically that they continue to, to rally uh, in, in the fall. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I just wasn't clear, CCIC has no no intermediation role here? <laughs> <laughs> we, we want to work with... Uh, You're not selling your book. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about um, financial developments and monetary policy. We've got the chief economist of the Exim Bank of China, uh, Wang Jianye, who also um, got his PhD. If you just take the subway up the west side, you can get to where he got his PhD at Columbia. Thank you, Steve. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The Chinese economy rebounded in 2012 amid global slowdown. As in 2009, the turnaround of last year was driven entirely by domestic demand. But unlike in 2009, there was no large dose of fiscal or quasi-fiscal stimulus. The monetary accommodation 
was also restrained. Employment continued to expand. Domestic consumption growth outpaced GDP growth. These developments <laughs> have important bearings on the Chinese economy going forward. Today, I would like to focus on one important aspect. That is the financial sector developments and their implications for China's monetary policy. There were a number of changes in China's financial sector that are worth noting. Bank lending used to account for a dominant share of China's so-called total social financing. And this share declined to about or below 60% by the end of the last year. Total social financing is a statistics compiled and published by the central bank, defined to include all financing received by the real sector, including financing intermediated by non-bank financial institutions, as well as the securities markets. A genuine corporate bond market expanded rapidly, admittedly from very low basis. China has a bond, has a, has a debt market, but if you're excluding treasury bills, central bank debenture, banks, debt issued by banks, mainly for wholesale funding purposes, as well as debt issued by local government sponsored platform or vehicles for utilities and, and other municipal infrastructure projects. The real corporate bond or high yield debt market is very, very, was very, very small. Financing provided by non-bank institutions, such as investment trusts, in conjunction with commercial banks of balance sheet activities, have also become a noticeable part of the financial sector. Last but not the least, <coughs> Chinese capital and financial accounts opened further. Foreign investors have been given larger access to China's financial market under both QV, Qualified Foreign Institution Investor for Foreign Currency Investment, and the RMB QV regime. All this imply that China's financial structure is changing, moving from a system where financial resources are highly concentrated in a few large nationwide banks, gradually towards a system where capital markets, non-bank financial institutions play a bigger role, and more small local or community banks catering to the needs of small and medium enterprises. Looking forward, I expect China's capital account will open further. Chinese capital market will develop further. Bank lending will remain, will remain an important part, but its share in total social financing will decline further. And China's capital and financial accounts will be more open despite volatile cross-border capital flows. These development have already and will continue to weaken the correlation between monetary aggregates and the nominal income in China. With a changing financial structure, monetary aggregates such as border money growth, as quoted by the previous speakers, and the bank lending limits, which the central bank used in China to manage domestic financial conditions, may not be as dominant in dictating domestic financial conditions. China's border money growth, M2 growth, in 2013 may be lower 
than in 2012. <coughs> but financial conditions may not be tighter. To ensure financial stability, Chinese authority need to further develop market-based monetary instruments that will require further interest rate deregulation. Interest rates will, in due course, eventually become the main tool of monetary policy in China, in addition to open market operation and, and other means. Around the mid-year 2012, the PBC, the People's Bank of China, the Central Bank of China, twice adjusted the relevant ceilings and floors for bank deposit and lending, effectively narrowing the commercial bank deposit and lending spread, allowing market forces to play a larger role in setting prices for financial services. 2013, we will see further powers in National Guard. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, with robust growth and low inflation, China is entering 2013 in a good position. With further market-based structural reforms, investment efficiency will increase, and China's macroeconomic management will become more effective, ensuring a steadier economic growth. The Chinese economy will continue to contribute to a stronger and more balanced and sustainable global economy. Thank you. Well, three terrific presentations. Let, let me use the prerogative of the moderator and ask the first question, which, um, you know, is, is we, you talked about non-bank lending, and that's discussed a lot in the, um, in the U.S. So my question is, and you suggested that 60% of the loan market is still bank, or a little less than 60% is still bank lending. So how big is this non-bank lending? In other words, what's the absolute RMB value of the non-bank lending? And what is the best estimate of the non-performing loans within the non-bank lending? <coughs> Any of the, though it's probably more for you. For you yet. To me or to? Well, uh, whoever wants to answer it, okay. all three. <laughs> Should we wait for them? You, you start? No. You, no. you start, I will. will Go ahead, them. answer. <laughs> no, 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 no other questions. I'm not going to let you out of this one. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, Steve, uh, I was in this uh, uh, China US, you know that there's been this leaders' uh, partnership uh, initiative. Uh, in a discussion, one of the major hedge fund uh, founder in the US. Exactly raising the same question after I, I talked. He didn't uh, pay me to answer. <laughs> so it's, I'm not surprised. Uh, that's so called a shadow banking, but I, I avoid using <laughs> this word. Uh, there's various estimates of the size of, of this. Uh, but let, let, me, let, me, let me tell you my view, though. Uh, I mentioned China's financial structure, and this structure is changing. Um, in, my, in my view, of balance sheet, activity of commercial bank, like here, is a financial <coughs> innovation and try to avoid the exchange interest rate regulation. On the one hand, you have a large pool of savings and there's a, there's a, there's a investors looking for high yield investment. And then you have a lot of projects need the investment, especially by small and medium enterprises. And the current system has not been effective in bridging this savings and investment. And hence comes the, 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 the so-called off-balance sheet uh, activities. And the way to deal with it, of course, there's a bring risk to commercial banks uh, a balance sheet. And, uh, and, and so, so it, it, uh, need to, it's shadow banking need to be regulated at, at, some, at some point. But my <laughs> point is uh, to address this issue, you have to develop the capital markets. And you have to develop a tiered banking system. And that's the way forward. And more important, 
further deregulate the interest rate. <coughs> and they are already on this path. I just might, I mentioned this was important last, last year, uh, Central Bank. Now, on the, on the size, uh, on, the on the wealth management products, you know, that's how, how they call it, uh, sell this to, to, to people. Uh, the, the IMF estimate is about <coughs> 15 to 20 percent of GDP, eight to nine trillions. Um, but if you look at more, more, there's a, there's a there's different components. A lot, most, first is the off balance sheet of, of activity of commercial banks. Then it's non banks, right? There's, there's small loan companies and, and things like this. Um, then there's a, there's a genuine parallel market in one, in one job. So it will be seven, six, three trillions. You add them together, maybe 16, around the 30% of GDP. But that is the one way to look at it. It's, it's a very estimate. Um, so that's. Uh, yeah, maybe I, I add two more points uh, <coughs> along uh, what uh, uh, Jane has just said. I think that uh, the uh, you know um, the problem I, I think that is uh, is catching a lot of attention in the marketplace, also uh, among policymakers in China. That's true. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, the the government still has a lot of room to address this. Okay. Uh, partly, uh, I think that they, uh, uh, we believe that there are two fundamental mismatching problems in the so-called central bank system. The first mismatching problem is really that uh, given that uh, the lending to, to a lot of extent is regulated and also that uh, a lot of enterprise, even local governments, okay, um, that has um, local governments that have good uh, public projects, such as the subway, okay. Uh, um, we know that around the globe, um, the, to my knowledge, tell me if I'm wrong, there is only one subway company that makes profit that's the Hong Kong subway, uh, Hong Kong, uh, subway company. All other subway companies don't make profit. Okay? They all receive some kind of government subsidy uh, one way or the other. So in a way that, uh, that uh, you know, for China to continue to develop, develop uh, urbanization is a key driver. And uh, certainly that uh, a lot of projects such as the subway will need to be financed uh, partly through probably uh, public financing. But in China, given that there's a local government, uh, it's not only uh, you know uh, it's a financial uh, limitation, but also it's related it's related to this uh, uh, the physical system. I think that will need also need to, uh, to be addressed by the new government. In a way that a, a good public finance project, probably yielding one to two percent, will need to be financed uh, by 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 you know the non-banking financial system, demanding seven eight percent. That uh, create a lot of pressure. That's the first mismatching. The second mismatching, of course, is that if you take all those roads, <coughs> then you have this, uh, uh, you know, uh, maturity mismatching. Every three years, the whole system is subject to a heart attack. The reason is that there, there is no, long, you know, no, uh, the government bond is not, a, a local <laughs> government bond is not, a, is not allowed, and uh, so in a way that they can only roll over once every three years or so. So I think that uh, the uh, uh, the problem is there. I think the problem can be addressable and. Uh, at the root, of course, the China will need to also to reform. I fully agree with what Jian said. You know, this uh, interest rate liberalization will be a key driver, okay, will be needed. In addition, I think that uh, taxation and the physical system also will need to be reformed. Can I eat? Sure. Yeah. First, I think, uh, you know, the, 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 because the, in China, by regulation, all the loans should be provided by banks. Mm -hmm. If you say the, the non-banking, you know, uh, the lending sometimes is said the underground, you know, and the vague. In vague terms, maybe it's illegal lending. You know, there's a lot of discussions about this issue, so-called underground financing or lending. Uh, but because the nature of this kind of activity, the, we sh a shortage of the accurate the figures. I remember I read some informal reports uh, a couple years ago give the total amount of uh, three trillions, you know, Chinese yen, but it's very inaccurate uh, by nature. But on the other hand, there's a related concept is so called of balance, uh, of uh, balance sheet uh, activities by the banks. That uh, we have the figure I reported in the total social financing. Then you can use that figure provided by PBOC. Then you can see last year, by the end, end of last year, it seems like both of the in-trust uh, loans as well as uh, trust loans, in total, maybe something like uh, uh, less than eight trillion Chinese yuan. Okay, but that is illegal, you know. That is, illegal. but uh, of course, why we have so many the so-called uh, the uh, shadow banking or so-called off-balance uh, 
uh, lending activities because of the two reasons. One reason may be related to uh, Haizhou's mention. You know, there's uh, driving forces to diversify the financial structure. That is a healthy uh, trend. But on the other hand, maybe also uh, encouraged by these kind of distortions because the interest rate in China is still not in the equilibrium. So uh, then the PBOC and the uh, regulatory bodies using a lot of quantitative controls on financial institutions that encourage these activities come up. So in summary, I think there is a narrow terms of that, which is maybe illegal. So this is why it's difficult to give accurate estimate. But uh, uh, related to that is so-called uh, off-balance lending. So actually, that is uh, not a very accurate concept. This is why it's difficult to give the accurate estimate. So it's equally as difficult to give an estimate as to what percentage of that either 9 trillion or 16 trillion is going to become non-performing. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Right? Shadow banking, you know. But, but in other words, banking. what we see is that there's a serious amount. We don't know. I mean, do we think it's 20 percent? Do we think it's? If, if you say that the off balance. Less, uh, you're shaking. Eight, eight, for example, 8 trillion Chinese yen for the uh, off balance uh, of a balance sheet uh, uh, lending is something like 15% uh, to the total, you know, and the credit as well as the broad money. Anybody want to answer? Otherwise, I'll open the floor to questions. I've abused my prerogative as the moderator. <coughs> and I see somebody waving frantically, way in the corner there. So there we are. I hope it's a good one with that frantic wave. <laughs> Please identify yourself also. Hi, uh, it's on. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nina Xiang. I'm uh, from China Memory Podcast. I have two questions. Number one is- You only get one. <laughs> OK. Uh, come next March, when the new uh, leadership take office, there is an uh, expectation that uh, for window dressing, there might be a new round of uh, fiscal investment. Um, how much? Uh, what is the scale that you think this fiscal investment will be and uh, its impact on uh, the GDP? Um, can I ask a second question? No. Nope. A lot of people have hands, so it's not, not fair. One is good. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Who wants to take that one? Yeah, oh, I, I just uh, a few words. Uh, actually, the last year, Chinese government took a very active fiscal policy stance. But it turned out that the, 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 the ratio of the deficits may be lower than what announced you know, in the last year's the Congress uh, conference. You know. uh, the, the reason for that is that uh, the tax uh, revenue has been increased uh, towards the end of last year. So as also mentioned by uh, Hai Zhou, uh, as well as Jian Ye, okay, we had the recovery of the economy uh, without too much relying on the excessive uh, stimulus policies. This year, I think uh, the new policy will still highlight, will still emphasize the so-called loose fiscal policy. So we will have a proactive fiscal policy. Actually, the policy in all other areas has been there already. So I think we will see continuity in these areas in this year. Over here. Helen Zhang from uh, City Private Bank. Um, my question will be relatively short. Um, we heard pretty uh, upbeat uh, estimates about China's economic growth from all panelists. I'm um, just curious if, you, if each of you could share with us your um, view, in your view, what are the likely tail risks for, uh, for China's economy, other than say, you know, it's not reaching your estimated growth rate. Thank you. What's the exact meaning? They're asking for an explanation of what you mean by tails. Tail risk, yeah. Maybe I tail risk, drags. Tail risk. Overestimate. Yeah, so what are the dra potential drags? Any potential black swans? Uh, well, US getting into recession, that would hurt China. <clears throat> we hope that won't happen. <laughs> Other drags? 
No? Mm -hmm. And some potential I, black swans. No, no, I, actually, I, I, if you look at the, around the globe, there are strong headwinds to global growth. If, if you want to, to, for me to name the, the, the highest, the, you know, the number one risk, I think that would be a synchronized slowdown or recession by Japan, US, and Europe. And we know your Eurozone is already in negative territory. And technically, from the US, well, the Japanese economy is also, right, um, uh, um, in, in a technical recession, if I may. Now, now here you have the fiscal cliff, and you, 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 <coughs> you tell me what, what's happened. But of course, uh, that, that's, it still can be avoided because uh, uh, it depends on, on, on policies by the relevant authorities. I think that's the biggest. If the G3 enter into recession, and that would bring the world economy to a second recession, and that would seriously impact on Chinese economy. So that's I think that's our number one. Number two, I see a rising tide of, uh, of protectionism. If this get out of hand, that will affect everybody. As we sit in the building which was closed as a result of Superstorm Sandy, does China not worry about the effects of climate change? And, and a potential catastrophe which would affect economic growth because of global climate change? Is, how do you factor that into the way you think about the economy in the coming years? We don't know the direction of that impact. <laughs> we talk about the global warming, but actually we witnessed in Beijing the coldest winter. Because, yeah, you know. Then the well, that's why we call it climate change. We yeah, don't call it global climate. warming anymore. <laughs> There's a, there's a third risk I want to, men, I want to mention to you is uh, given all the major central banks are under <coughs> highly unconventional monetary policy mode, um, I, w I would not be surprised to, re re um, to replay what's, what's going on in 2009, 2010, 2011. There's a large capital gush into the emerging market economy coming out. So that's what a water tool. International capital flow was seriously testing emerging markets, economies, uh, macro management capacity, China included. Hi, my, my name is Vivian Tao. I work for a hedge fund here. Um, my, my question is, uh, the balance sheet of this Central bank in, in China has expanded sig significantly in the past decade, and I think the growth rate actually outpaced the um, uh, GDP growth. So this this certainly create create a lot of uh, issue for chi China, and I think the part of the reason might be that China had to keep a stable currency, so China was forced to import inf inflation. So. Um, so uh, I, I think part, 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 part of the issue created for China is a huge, is a, is a huge um, upward pressure on the asset price. <coughs> so um, does it mean that China actually does not have the flexibility with one of the important uh, policy tools? And do you think what, what actions uh, or what China could do differently to uh, at the same time, keep a stable currency and also um, able to keep the uh, asset inflation, uh, asset price under check. Okay. Can I? Yeah. Yes, you are correct. Uh, the, 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 the total balance scale in the PBOC is substantially higher than something like 1.6 times of the GDP growth rate, nominal GDP growth rate, as well as even 20%, uh, almost 20% higher than the total growth broad money. That indicates, you know, the, the financial repression. But fortunately, we see in the recent years, over the one year or so, uh, that kind of trend, you know, has been stabilizing. 
because China absorbing less and less incremental growth of the uh, foreign exchange reserve has been uh, declining, you know, has been controlled and uh, flatted out. So the, the growth of the, the growth uh, momentum of the uh, total uh, asset size uh, for the PVC, PVOC has been stabilized. So I think in future, this is why I think uh, it is not, it is desirable for China to have stabilized the growth model in future, pattern in future, then allow PBOC to wind down gradually, but not uh, too rapidly, the, the too much sites, too large sites of the asset accumulated over the last 10 years or so. That also one, uh, one of the structural challenge in the macroeconomic policy in China. I think uh, that process has been started already, hopefully will continue in future. Just one sentence. You mentioned the size of Chinese central bank balance sheet. But please note, there's a major distinction between the Chinese central bank balance sheet and the balance sheet of, of the Fed, ECB, and Bank of Japan. Yeah, I want our, to our, side, our liability matching by, by a massive asset. Unlike you know, other central banks, they're mostly at their own treasury bills. Okay, so so they're, they're, they're large commercial bank, excess reserve, earning 25 base point in a central bank, but not the situation in China. One sentence, yeah. I think that uh, interest rate liberalization and the uh, internationalization will be the uh, solution going forward. Uh, also, as Lu Feng said, that uh, if you look at the uh, M2 growth rate, M2 growth rate came down substantially now to uh, around 14% per annum which is not uh, so way above China's growth, nominal GDP growth rate. Short one. We only have time for uh, one Patrick more. Patrick Ng from the Gaucho Investment Group. In the U.S., I understand what a non-performing loan is. It's based on covenants and structures. Pretty simple. But maybe this is a dumb question. What is a non-performing loan in China? The structural, the practical, or the legal definition? <laughs> Banker. <laughs> the banker uh, Chin Chow's response was it's basically the same. We have five <laughs> classes. Uh, we have what, time for then one merit right behind. Thank you, Merit Jano, Columbia University. Um, I guess we've heard this morning a consensus view of sorts, so all have echoed it of, around uh, financial repression being a problem in China about uh, further capital account uh, opening up and interest rate deregulation. And I wonder if you could just say a little bit more. Do you think there is a consensus view that interest rate deregulation is a necessary next step? And what would be the triggers uh, for actions to be taken? Okay. Yes. There's a consensus. Each each five year, we have the five year plan. You know, actually, in the eleventh five year plan, you know, ten years ago, we, we said we will deregulate interest rate regulation to liberalize the interest regulation. Actually, there's a lot of efforts has been put forward by the PBOC as well as well as other ministries of the central government to, for example, Shamber. You know, Shamber, it is the the, the infrastructure. You know, building for the for the for these kind of the interbank, uh, you know, and uh, infrastructure. Uh, how can I say? And uh, as a basis, uh, designed for the uh, interest rate liberalization. Actually, uh, the, the, a couple of months ago, you know, and uh, because now China's interest regulation mainly there's a ceiling, you know, for the uh, deposit rate as well as a flow, you know, for the for the lending rate. Actually, uh, the, a, couple, a couple months ago, you, China's uh, PBOC gave some kind of 10% of the you know, fluctuation for the uh, uh, ceilings for the deposit rate. It has been reported in media a couple of days ago. Maybe there's some uh, very radical proposals has been uh, discussed in, in, in media. You know, maybe there's some breakthroughs. I think uh, uh, anything can happen. I agree with Justin Lin's and, uh, assessment. That is a very important 
factor behind the income in uh, inequality. So reform of that will enhance efficiency as well as improve the income distribution. But well, we're going to take about a 12-minute uh, break. We will reconvene at 10.30 when we'll hear Qin Xiao talk about the, um, the new leadership and the reform agenda. But let's thank the panel for terrific discussion.